if you are looking for the workshop on attachment, you have found it uh, with me, Jason Van Ruler, a therapist. I just had to say that for everybody because I know it's been a little bit since you've heard it. And so I wanted to bring it out again for your benefit. So anyway, I am thrilled to be here tonight. I have been really looking forward to this. I know making some of these reels on attachment, I've gotten some really good feedback. And what I've learned from that is that people are really interested in attachment and how that plays a role in their lives and how that plays a role in their relationships. And so what I wanted to do tonight was kind of dig into attachment in a little bit more depth, a little bit more explanation and kind of put this into some patterns, some themes, and then talk about practically what do we do with that, right? So sometimes we do these reels on just kind of things to notice, but where do we actually go from there? And so that's kind of my goal as we walk through this is to give you some practical, tangible things that you can do, but also to explain it a little bit. So first and foremost, I'll just introduce myself uh, because I think some people probably aren't super familiar with me, but I'll just tell you, my name is Jason Van Ruler. I am a therapist. I'm in private practice. I have been for over a decade and during that time have worked a lot with children, adults. I worked everywhere from mental health hospitals to institutions to Department of Corrections. Uh, and now today I own a practice that spans multiple states and I work a lot with couples and individuals on things like this. So this is kind of the stuff that I do every single day is to help people learn more about their attachment and how to get connected. Um, I was not always a therapist, if you can believe that. I always dressed like one. So ever since being a kid, I've dressed like I was a 60 year old man. So I've really been fit for the job my whole life, but I was not always a therapist. There was a time where I owned a recruiting company. And at that time, I love working with people. But what I realized is that in working with people, so many of us have stuff that has happened to us or that we've been through that really pulls the strings in our lives and our relationships, and we don't even know it. And so doing that work of recruiting, I got to talk to people a lot about what was motivating their decisions and their relationships. And I learned that that was just something so interesting to me. And some of it was interesting to me kind of selfishly because I came from a very rough background. Um, I had a difficult childhood. My parents divorced early and it was just not an easy time. And so I came out of that with, and we'll talk about it more today, but just a blueprint for relationships that was not really going to work out for me. It was a blueprint for relationships that was ultimately going to lead to a lot of heartache. And so coming out of that and talking to people and recognizing that I wasn't the only one really led me to want to invest in helping people and selfishly helping myself, right? Because I thought that if I could do the work to learn a healthy relationship, that then maybe I could in turn have healthy relationships, have a different legacy than my parents and help people do the same. And so that's how I come to you today as a person who works in practice. I do a bunch of workshops and intensives trying to help couples as well as people just live a life with healthy relationships with themselves and others. And that's led me to do some speaking and writing as well. And so I just kind of love all those opportunities because at the end of the day, I love to help people like this as much as I prepare for it and take the time. Like I really do value working with all of you and just you making the time tonight to be here. So that's just a little bit about me and I'll tell you a little more as we go. But what I like to do is kind of talk about expectations for the event. Being a trauma guy and coming from a trauma background, I know that for some of us, uh, sometimes doing some of this work can actually be kind of triggering. And so I wanna to explain to you kind of where I'm at and where I think we're gonna go so that you have an idea of what to expect. So tonight, my expectations for this event are just number one, that you would understand attachment styles so that you probably will walk away with a little bit more in-depth understanding than you had about each attachment style. And then also where you fit in. Now it's my hope that you took the attachment quiz. Don't worry if you didn't, but my hope would be that you did and that you're coming into this kind of knowing where you're at in that. But if you don't, just kind of realize as we go, what, what seems like it fits for me or maybe what seems like it fits for my partner and where do I fit into that? And if you didn't do the attachment quiz, you sure can after, don't worry about that. Another thing that I should probably note right now is I'm gonna tell you to write some stuff down. So if you don't have a paper and pencil or you don't have your notes up on your computer, you might want to, because a couple of times throughout this process, I'll say, hey, write that down or take a second and note something. And so I'll want you to do that. So I want you to understand your relationships. I want you to understand your attachment style. I also want you to know where your strengths and weaknesses are and where you might need to do some work. So my hope tonight is you come out of this feeling a little bit empowered in the sense that maybe it's not as bad as you thought. 
Maybe you listen to this and you go, geez, it's actually okay, or I'm doing better than I thought. Um, but maybe we also recognize some places where there's an opportunity to do some further work. Maybe there's some things you haven't thought of for a long time, or some just kind of nagging patterns that keep showing up in your life that you want to do something with. Another expectation I have is that you have some steps for the future. So I want to send you home with some homework, like the good teacher that I am, just because I think insight without action is not always so helpful. And so if I just talk to you tonight and blab for a long time, A, you'll probably be bored, but you'll probably leave here and not do much with it. And so my hope for you is you leave tonight and you do something with the information you learn. First, I'm going to present on attachment. And I'm gonna answer questions afterwards that have been submitted and then also questions that you submit. So along the way, you can submit questions. Now I'll tell you that as I'm talking, I actually will try to answer some questions if they come up with kind of two caveats. Number one would just be that it's related to what I'm talking about. And then number two, that it's more general than specific. If it's a really long question that's tailored to your specific situation, that's gonna be challenging to answer in this context. But if you have a question that you feel like, man, I just wish he'd speak to this real quick, let me know and I'll try to grab it as we go or have my assistant mention that to me. So just know that you can do that. Um, in the next week or so after the workshop, you will receive a link so that you can watch the workshop again and then a PDF that'll walk through all the bullet points that we've talked about tonight so that you have that as a resource. Aside from those expectations, I just wanna remind you that even though I am a therapist in real life, this is not therapy. Um, and part of the reason is because it wouldn't honor your story. So this is not therapy because we're talking more generally than specifically to your story. And while you might identify with some of it and it might really hit home or you might say that's part of my story too, Jason, the goal is not to do individual therapy with you. And again, I think I'm a little biased here, but I will just tell you, it's my thought process that therapy is helpful for people to dig into this stuff. And so I think your story deserves that if something's coming up for you tonight. So just be aware, it's not therapy, but hopefully it's the catalyst to doing some work and having some insight. I also just wanna mention that I want this to be a safe space for you. I think a lot about how does this stuff affect people, right? So I sit here and I just talk and um, I'm not at your house. I don't, I don't know how you're feeling. I don't know what you're bringing into today. Maybe you're coming off of a really difficult day at work or maybe you've had conflict in your relationship or maybe it's your birthday or a really fantastic day. I don't know that. And so I just want to make a little bit of space for the fact that I don't know. And so as we talk tonight, we'll talk about some things that could be kind of difficult. They could be kind of challenging. You might think, oh, I haven't thought about that for a long time. Or man, I don't often go to that place. And that's okay. That's okay. Some of those things will come up, but I want you to just pay attention to how you're feeling. And if you need to take a second or you need to take a break, just know that's okay. You can watch this again afterwards. And if you need to take a break, maybe to do some breathing exercise or journaling or go for a walk. But I just want you as we go through this process to take really good care of yourself and just be aware of what you're bringing in and how you're feeling presently. And if there's something that comes up um, that I could actually help with, please comment that and I'll do my best to accommodate because what I want is this to be a safe space for you to do some good work. Now, as we talk tonight, I am gonna go through some resources that I use to put this together. And I'll be honest with you, there's a ton of them and I'm kind of lazy, so I didn't grab like 50, but I just grabbed kind of the key ones that I wanted you to know about because I think they could be helpful to you too. And so some of the resources that I'll be using are uh, this book, if you can see, is um, it's called Attachment Theory and it's by Thias Gibson. And this is a very good book in the sense that it's very practical. So it kind of breaks down attachment theory as well as what we can do with it and kind of talks practically about what do we do if we're looking for a relationship? How does that work? So I think this is like a great book if you're dating and kind of figuring out who am I going to connect with best. The next book that I use a lot is this one right here, which is The Power of Attachment, and that's by Diane Heller. And this was a fantastic book just talking about how we work towards secure attachment and strength in our relationships. So I certainly recommend it. Attach is one that you probably know by Amir Levine. Lots of great research in this, and so I'll be referencing it quite a bit. And then lastly, we have Attachment Theory in, uh, in Practice by Sue Johnson. Sue Johnson's a big EFT person, emotionally focused therapy, something I've trained on quite a bit and I think is really helpful to couples. And so that might be something that you take a look at. So I'll reference some of those books along the way and just know that's what I'm talking about. And again, we'll put that on the resource PDF for you if you're interested in purchasing those. Next, I just wanna talk a little bit about 
how I view workshops like this. So, so often I'll put on a workshop and I will talk to somebody afterwards and they'll say, you know, Jason, that was so cool because I had some really great insight, but here's what I realized because of that insight actually really screwed things up. I have lots of regrets now. I look back at the past through this filter of the present and I feel really terrible. And just so you know, like that is not what I want for you. What I want for you is to take this information and to empower yourself to do something different if you need to. I want you to take this information and give yourself some grace. And so as we go through this, if you're a person and just know I can't relate at all, I'm kidding. But if you're a person who uses information that you gain to kind of bring yourself to a place of feeling guilty or shame, just know like I don't want that for you. Like what I want tonight to be for you is to be an experience where you take some information that carries you to the next place. It's a catalyst. And so if you catch yourself going into that place, just remind yourself that like, that's not why you're doing better to remind yourself about your failures in the past. So we'll talk about that. And then lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about um, in these uh, explanations that we'll talk about, we'll talk about some negative traits, but we're also going to talk about some positive. And it's my belief that, you know, we spend an awful lot of time on how attachment theory negatively impacts us. But what's true for myself and I think others as well is that for all those negative things we could say, there's also a flip side. And that flip side is often things that we have done that are positive. They're often things that help us to be better at our job, even better in our relationships sometimes or to deal with specific situations. And so I'm just going to challenge you to not maybe just only focus on the negative, but also see what has this led me to in terms of strength, right? So I'm avoidant, let's say, and I tend to leave relationships quickly. I tend to be on the lookout for risk. How does that help me in my career? How does it help me with friendships? Because I guarantee you there's a part of it that works. There's probably a part of it that doesn't work too, but there's both. And the both part is really important. So that's kind of my heads up about where we're going, what we're going to be doing. Again, along the way, I'll try to just give uh, some insight as it comes up. If you have questions, comments, I'll try to speak to those as much as I can. Uh, if I don't, don't take it personally, just know there's a lot going on tonight. Um, and then we'll go from there. But my hope is that this is really helpful and useful for you. So let's get started. What is attachment theory, right? Um, this is something that I really had no idea about, to be honest with you, until I started in graduate school. Um, if you would have asked me what attachment theory was, I, I don't know, I think I would have struggled to answer that. But what I learned early on is that attachment theory was really, really important and began really in the 60s. So there was a person named Bowlby and a person named Ainsworth, both psychiatrists and psychologists, and they were really interested in why we do what we do, how we become what we become. And so Bowlby had this idea that he would start working with teenagers to try to understand their story and how it's impacting both their teenage years as well as their adult years. And so he started doing this and paired up with Ainsworth, who was doing some great work with structural psychology and just understanding family systems. And so they got together and one of their most famous experiments was this strange situation experiment. And basically what that was is that they would have a child. And by the way, I don't think you could do this at all today. Uh, in research terms, it'd be very hard to get past the review board, but here we are anyway. They would have a situation where they would have a mother and a child, a baby, and there would be an assistant. And so the child would be in the room kind of playing and abruptly the mother would leave. And so what they would look at is how did the baby respond to that? Did the baby just continue to play? Did it have a fit and begin really crying? Did it kind of isolate, go in a corner? What did it do? And this is really the catalyst for a lot of what we talk about today in attachment theory is how does that child respond? And so what they theorized is that how that child responds to the parent says a lot about the relationship with the parent. And let's be honest, when you're a baby, there are many years where we literally need our parents to live, right? We're not gonna be able to live without them. And so that relationship is paramount. And is also, you might hear me refer to it as the blueprint for other relationships, because how we have a relationship with our parent, our caregivers, kind of tells us how relationships are gonna look because we internalize that. And so what they talked about then is they, they said, okay, well, there's these attachment styles that we see, and then how do they show up the rest of life? So they kind of begin in childhood, and then how do those play out? And since that time, we've done a lot of research and actually they've refined some of those ideas. And so some of the stuff that, you know, Bowlby and Ainsworth talked about or even theorized has now been changed a little bit. But that was their initial idea is that they could, through identifying an attachment style, kind of decide or determine how a person's relationships would work. 
So great, what are attachment styles? Well, that's a little bit of a point of contention. So it kind of depends on who you ask, but for tonight, because you probably use that attachment project quiz, I wanted to stick with what they have. Now I'll tell you, they're anxious, they're disorganized, avoidant, insecure. So there's four of them. However, some people lump disorganized and avoidant into the same category, uh, and that's just a thing that they've done. I don't know really either way, which is better. I, I like probably more detail than less. So four versus three is okay. Uh, but you might say, I'd rather just see three and that's okay too. Uh, but I'm going to use four in the terms that we're talking about tonight. So I want to say that although Bowlby really thought attachment styles were like the end all be all of our life and we're this huge predictor, they are in fact a predictor, but they have to kind of be taken into consideration with other things. And those other things might be personality styles, love languages. There's actually some fantastic research about love languages and how they interact with attachment styles. Enneagram, if you're familiar with that, as well as just some other factors, like things um, sort of like who our parents are, our relational stability. Do we have caregiver support? Do we have important medical factors in our childhood? What's our temperament, environmental factors, and other things? And so when we look at this, it's not just kind of like this end-all be-all. There's all these other parts attached to it. And so it's a little more complicated. And I think that's one thing I've really learned in working with people is that it's easy to kind of identify these patterns and say, well, that's it. But what's true is that there's actually all these other pieces attached. And so as you hear this tonight, just realize it's probably more complicated than you thought. And to really investigate, we got to look at some of these other factors and how they contribute. So today, lots of research is taking place about how this works. And some of that research is actually saying that attachment styles play this huge role in our profession, in our friendships, in our parenting, all these things. And so they're actually expanding the field. There's also been people who have challenged some of that. And so it's really kind of an exciting time. Uh, Dr. Amir Levine, who wrote Attached, is doing some great work and just synthesizing the research in a really promising way. And so right now, it's exciting for attachment theory and research. They're also identifying some factors that they feel are genetic. And so they say there might be this genetic predisposition to an attachment style that then is brought out by certain environmental factors. So very exciting time. Some common misconceptions though that I wanna address as we kind of get rolling here is that um, attachment cannot change. So I hear that a lot where people say, my attachment style is my attachment style and it's almost like this fatalistic view. And what's actually you know, more accurate is that it can change, but like any change that we make, it takes work, it takes intention. So it is difficult to change, but not impossible. And so that's important to note. And then to note that we, and this I find really interesting, but this is, we might have different attachment styles in different relationships. So there's some research that says, I might have a different attachment style in a romantic relationship than a friendship, than a job, just depending on the person and the environment. And so that to me is fascinating. And so they're kind of challenging some of these beliefs. And what I like about that last one is that if you can be securely attached in a professional environment, there's a lot of hope for romantic environment if that's where you struggle because you have some of the skills already. So just know, I, I think for most of us, we have the skills that we need. We just have to figure out how to put those into a new environment. So as I go through all this stuff, if you're like me, I'm sitting where you're sitting and I'm going, okay, this is awesome, but uh, who cares? Like, why is it important? And I'll tell you why it's important to me. I think it's important to me because this is the blueprint, like I said, that we look at our relationships through. This is really a thing that helps us identify our patterns and the themes of our relationships. It explains in some ways why we might feel like we can't make a relationship work or why we feel like we can't trust people or why we feel like we keep finding the wrong person, or why we feel like we have to always feel find the exact right person. It, it plays a huge role in our insight and awareness. And so to me, that's very important. I have a good friend and he says, you know, Jason, um, we are always reacting to or reflecting our childhood. And I just couldn't agree more. And I think attachment theory has a lot to do with that, right? Are we reacting to how we were raised in those relationships or are we actually just reflecting that? And I would argue if we don't know what we're doing, we're probably reflecting it more than reacting to it because it takes intention to break out of that, even if we didn't want to replicate it. And so I think we just have to kind of figure out like, how do we want it to look? How did it look from where we came? And then how do we get there? But in my opinion, it's sort of like buying an Ikea dresser 
and you open up like the, uh, the um, table of contents and you're trying to find the instructions to build it. But like, imagine half of it's ripped out. Like, you know what it looks like, but you don't know how to get there if you didn't have that kind of childhood. And so what I wanna help you do is have a little bit better understanding of what it actually looks like and how to get it. Because I think that's the missing link that we have is that for those of us who come out of childhood without a secure attachment, we know what we want, right? We all want love, we all want acceptance, we wanna be valued and chosen, but not all of us know how to get it. And so hopefully tonight we can get a little closer to the how we get it. So let's talk a little bit about each attachment style. Because I think to really understand how this works out in our relationships, we have to have a better understanding of each style. So I wanna start with secure attachment. It's a popular kid in school. Everybody wants to be securely attached, right? It's, it's, they get the Letterman jacket, like they are pretty awesome. And it definitely seems that way, but what's true is not everyone is and most people aren't. But let's talk about secure attachment. So in secure attachment, I want you to visualize Velcro, okay? So we're just gonna be very like, stick to it and it's uh, it's attachment, right? So Velcro, how does Velcro attach? Well, there's like a side that sticks to the other side, right? So there's a sticky side and non-sticky side. And what's awesome about Velcro is it can securely hold on to things, but it can detach when necessary, right? Like it doesn't get all messed up. It retains its shape and its structure. And so it can kind of go back and forth. And secure attachment is a lot like this. It allows people with secure attachment to attach to people, when it makes sense and when they're intentional and it's a healthy relationship and then detach when they want to without a lot of loss, right? It's not very messy or confusing. It's just pretty cut and dry. And so they are Velcro. And oftentimes the Velcro comes from Velcro, right? So they come from parents who were often available and supportive and nurturing. Some of their traits are they're obviously secure in their relationships, right? And they can have boundaries, uh, but they also have a sense of boundaries internally they're into open communication, they can have intimacy, and they generally kind of navigate relationships without a lot of thought, um, without a lot of analysis, just kind of showing up and being present, which sounds amazing, by the way. Um, and so they don't do that thing some of us do where they overthink it, um, or they overanalyze, or they stress about things, they just kind of show up. How that plays out in relationships is, as you'd expect, like it's pretty awesome. If they find someone else with secure attachment, these are the type of relationships we want. They're safe, they're healthy, Velcro attaches to Velcro, it all kind of works out and it's lasting. The challenge, however, to secure attachment is when they find relationships with people who are not securely attached or they get into this place where they wanna save people, they wanna rescue people. And so they kind of do this thing where they say, I'm Velcro and that's amazing for me and you're not. And so I'm gonna pull you out of whatever it is that you're in and save you. And when they do that, that's when actually secure attachment has really unfortunate, unhealthy relationships. So that's kind of their Achilles heel is when they fall into a pattern of rescuing or trying to save someone who's struggling. An example of this is I have a good friend and his name is Jim and he was born to parents who were both school teachers. And so the thing is, is like, even though they didn't have a lot of money, they struggled financially. They were a close family. Like they had meals together. They talked, they uh, could talk about feelings. They had, you know, a good example of how marriage worked. They had a budget, like they did all the right things, even though they had real life challenges. And so Jim has now kind of gone on and he's become this guy that is just pretty safe to be around. And maybe, you know, somebody like this, um, sometimes you'll meet people and you'll say like, I think I could just talk to them for hours. Like they seem really safe to me or comforting. And so that's that type of person who comes from the secure attachment where we go like those people are they're just nice to be around. Like I just trust them inherently because they have an air of trust and they have an air of comfort and confidence that some of the other people with different attachment styles don't have. So that's an example of secure attachment. Next, let's talk a little bit about anxious attachment. Okay, so if secure attachment is Velcro, anxious attachment in my mind is double-sided tape. Okay, and the reason it's double-sided tape is it sticks to everything all the time. Okay, if you have used double-sided tape, inevitably you have tried to stick it to something and then it's stuck to your hand and then it's stuck to the desk and it's stuck to the other piece of paper and it just sticks to everything all the time because that's what it does, right? And it's a little bit funny to talk about, but what's true is that it's hard to interact with that anxious attachment without it sticking or wanting to stick more, right? And so that's one of the hallmarks of anxious attachment is just kind of having that need for reassurance and connection even more than we're getting. 
And so they can securely attach, but sometimes it's a little too sticky. Sometimes there's a little too many demands or things like that. This, as you might imagine, typically comes from parents who are inconsistent during childhood. It's important to note it's often more related to absence than it is to abuse or dysfunction uh, because a disorganized style is more related to trauma, abuse, dysfunction, things like that. But I want you to think a little bit of someone who had parents that had a volatile divorce at a young age. And so they were always kind of torn between two people coming and going. And so they didn't really know what to expect. In the instance of the strange situation with the baby, the anxious attachment would be like, is mom coming back or is dad? I don't know. And without that confidence, a lot of anxiety is created. Okay. Some traits of this are people pleasing. Can you imagine that? Yes. People pleasing. I can relate to that one fear of rejection, strong fear of being abandoned, they can also need lots of reassurance, right? And so um, they might ask in varying ways, am I doing okay? Is this right? Uh, how are things? On the positive side, uh, what they'll do is they're very perceptive, right? They're good at identifying feelings. They're good at insight and awareness. And so that helps them to really thrive in some places, but in the closest of emotional relationships and connection, it gets really, really scary. And so they need lots of data and experience to tell them they're okay. A core wound that they would have, and I wanna just take a second and say, when I talk about wounds, I think of it really in terms of what are the questions that we ask ourselves that maybe we don't ask out loud, but we have on our heart. And I know that's a really therapist thing to say, but I believe that all of us kind of have these questions on our heart about ourselves that we ask over and over again. And so this wound for someone with anxious attachment would be, am I loved? Am I chosen? Am I okay? How this plays out in relationships, as you can imagine, it can be a little much and not in a bad way, just because there's a, a legitimate need there, but it can be a little much in terms of that relationship because again, you need a lot of reassurance. And then also something that we would wanna note is that with anxious attachment, there can be real confusion about what it looks like to compromise and sacrifice. And so people with anxious attachment are often sacrificing when what they needed to do is compromise. And if they're not careful, resentment builds. It's that whole, I did this, this, and this because I anticipated your need, why aren't you more grateful? And so if they're not careful, they start to build a life around that where we have these relationships that require us to sacrifice instead of compromise and they fall flat. A story is I have another friend uh, and he has lived this in many ways. Those parents got divorced when he was very young. He was five and they had this really acrimonious divorce and they went back and forth and it was volatile for a long time. And so he just kind of learned like he couldn't really count on either parent being there um, when they were there, like they loved him and he knew it, but it was just this back and forth all the time. And so in spite of all of his success, a super successful person, you or I might look at him on paper and say like, oh, this guy's got it all. Uh, in his heart, he doesn't know that. And so it comes out sideways sometimes because he'll have to seek reassurance when it doesn't really make sense to. And so, um, you know, we just note that, but when we do the work that starts to lessen and we don't need it as much. So next, if we had Velcro, uh, which is secure attachment, we had our anxious attachment, which is double-sided tape. Our avoidant attachment is a post-it note. And the reason it's a post-it note is because there is a big square of paper and a very small part that sticks. And the reason for that is because with the void and attachment, there is just a real hesitation and risk involved in connecting. And so they're slow to do it and they're quick to leave it. And so like a post-it note, if you, you know, stick it on something and the wind blows or it moves too much, you know, it will fall off, right? It is not really made to take a lot of movement. It's not really made for a lot of chaos or conflict or things like that. And so this post to know there's a lot more to it, but just this little part for connection. And it takes some real effort to build on that. Where this usually comes from is having parents who were absent during childhood period. The absence could have been physical, emotional, or relational. So instead of coming kind of back in and out, they're just gone period. And some traits that go along with it are that they can appear withdrawn. They're highly independent. They have a tendency to be emotionally distant, to struggle, to connect on an emotional level. Um, they have some challenges, like I said, with that little sticky part, uh, being connected to a partner in really intimate and important ways. And they get overwhelmed, especially in terms of being with someone who might have anxious attachment, who needs stuff all the time. It's very overwhelming for them. And they have some trouble recognizing their own needs because oftentimes no one really cared about what their needs were. And so they're not quite sure how to do that. On the positive side, these people are, are very gregarious, they're hard workers, they're industrious, um, they're entrepreneurs, they're, they're people who get it done, but they have this belief they have to do it on their own. 
And that's really the place where they get exhausted and it kind of falls apart is that no one person can do everything on their own all the time. And so this becomes a thing for avoidant attachment where they're both lonely and afraid of connection. The wounds that they carry with them would be a sense of defectiveness and then uncertainty in relationships. Because again, they have good reason to do this. It makes sense they would be uncertain. They might believe people are unsafe and that vulnerability equals pain, which makes a lot of sense. How does this play out in relationships? Well, you might guess if we have like a post-it note and the double-sided tape or a post-it note and the Velcro, this is a challenge there, right? Um, if they're not careful, avoidant attachers can be very aloof. They can be serial daters. They can be non-committal. They can struggle to meet emotional needs and they can appear at times like they really don't care about things other than themselves. And what's true is they do actually care about that. They do want relationship, but that's how it comes across. Now, I've got another friend uh, who struggles with this attachment style and has just been married several times and with the goal of always finding the right one, right? Because if I find the right one, then I'm going to have this relationship that I really want. It's going to feel safe and I'm going to really connect, Jason. Like I'm going to go full post-it note, not partial post-it note. But what's true is that doesn't happen. And so it becomes a search until we realize our role in that, right? Until we say like, maybe I'm not putting myself out there as much as I think, or maybe I have a common theme in my life that I need to work on. Lastly, we have disorganized attachment. And disorganized attachment, I like to describe it this way. My daughter has this unicorn glue and she's super into unicorns and it's super fun, uh, but it's this glue where it has like these little unicorns floating around in the glue and then all these sparkles and all this stuff. And while unicorn glue looks pretty cool and has got some stuff in it, it actually doesn't stick to much. It tries really hard. I mean, it's advertised it's doing that, but it doesn't. And so unicorn glue is kind of like disorganized attachment in the sense that the unicorns often are trauma, their abuse, their chaos. And so even though they really want to stick to others and be attached, it's just a challenge because of all the other stuff floating around. And so with this disorganized attachment, it becomes kind of hit or miss to how well it sticks. And sometimes the unicorns totally get in the way and they wreck it for everything else. Now, as I alluded to, this typically comes from experiences with parents or caregivers who are unpredictable and often come from kind of two different places. One is a parent that might have struggled with addiction. Another one is a parent that struggled with emotional, uh, excuse me, mental illness. Because in those two places, it becomes very predictable and also at times abusive and traumatic. And so when a kiddo grows up with that, they struggle, obviously, to trust others. And they feel as though betrayal is imminent because in a lot of ways it has been. And so when we have that belief, what happens is that we start to try to anticipate risk and we start to just think that we're going to be betrayed. And so sometimes we jump out when we really didn't even need to because we anticipate something because of how it feels. And so in this attachment style, we have oftentimes a lot of trauma that we need to work through to start to meet those needs of our heart so that we can show up in our relationships. So the wounds that we have with this attachment style are feeling unsafe, feeling unworthy, fearing being taken advantage of. And how it plays out, like I said, is it kind of creates a roller coaster in the relationship uh, because they want love, but they also feel they're going to be betrayed. And so we kind of jump in and jump out. And when we do that, what happens is that it just creates this chaos. And for people who are maybe securely attached, they're not quite sure what to do with that, right? Because they don't see the threat that the disorganized person sees. And so they kind of go, wow, what is happening? Where are you reacting to? How is that working? Um, and you might also see like a love-hate relationship that might stem from this place too. Uh, another story would just be, I have a friend uh, and he actually grew up in another country that was just riddled with war as he grew up. And so during that time of war, his father was an alcoholic. And so not only did he have really this, this whole war going on, but he also had this unsafe father. And so as he came out of that, even though now he is a successful person, um, he's fun, loving, happy, all these things, internally, it still feels like he's that child, right? It still feels like at any time someone could burst through the door. At any time, dad might be drunk and we might have to deal with that. And so he struggles in relationships because it's kind of this idea of like, how do I anticipate the bad thing that I'm sure is going to happen? And it causes him to jump out of relationships where he shouldn't and then occasionally stay in relationships way too long. Uh, just because he doesn't, he doesn't uh, want to jump out. And so he goes, well, I won't jump out, I'll stay in. And so the timing and the cadence are kind of off. Now, someone just asked uh, a question, which I think is a good question. Where do narcissists typically fall into this? 
And I think uh, oftentimes I see that kind of in that avoidant attachment style, I think uh, could be really all different types because again, attachment styles are also in the context of personality styles and experience and all those things. But the avoidant attachment style oftentimes is where I'll see narcissistic behavior. And a lot of that comes from a place of just feeling like they have to meet their own needs. Um, and then that being really exacerbated and them just running with it. So I see that often. So great question on that one. So the next thing I want to talk a little bit about after talking about all the different styles is probably something that's really important to all of you, which is how does this work out in relationships? Like, okay, I know my attachment style, Jason. I'm double-sided tape. I get it. Um, I stick to everything and then want to stick to more. Uh, but what do I do with that in my relationships? How does that work out? Because I, I read this fantastic quote and it said, um, there are no problems with your attachment style until you're in a relationship. And I just thought like that makes a lot of sense, right? Because you don't really notice it until you're with somebody. And the thing is, some of us have these really rock solid relationships that people would dream of and they seem like they can weather any storm. And then other ones have these really chaotic relationships and we find ourselves just like repeating that pattern. And it reminds me, and you can totally look this up. Maybe I'll even put it on the resource page if you want. But there was a story about a year ago in Oregon where uh, a guy stole a car and was driving away very quickly from police. He was on like a high speed chase, driving down Main Street. And there was a woman who also stole a car, evading police, driving down Main Street. They did not know each other, but they are driving 100 miles an hour and they run into each other, crash and, you know, go to jail. It all ends badly. But I think I tell that story because sometimes we have relationships like that, right? Where we don't really understand like what's going on with us. And we just like, smoke somebody head on and we're just right into this very passionate intense relationship and it crashes and burns and then we find ourselves at the end of that wondering like how did this happen and what's true is that it's not that we stole cars most of the time I mean those people did but but what's more often true is we just don't have a good understanding of where we came from and what we're working with or what our partner's working with so I want to talk a little bit about this. And I know before you even ask it, uh, someone might say like, Jason, shouldn't we just be with a securely attached person? Like, wouldn't that just make life really simple? And yes, sure, that would improve things. It would make it a little bit easier. And also, that's just not how the world works. Not everyone is securely attached. And so there's all the rest of us who uh, want to date and have love and romance too. And so being with a securely attached person can help but that's not always gonna be the case. And we can still have healthy relationships even if we're not with a securely attached person. So I just want you to kind of underline that, like that can still happen. It takes intention and willingness, but it can still happen. So let's kind of walk through some of the different combinations. So first one I touch on is just secure person with a secure person. This is super awesome. They are the popular kids, things just kind of work out. It's great for them. They have lots of emotional regulation, connection, trust, and they have an ability to resolve conflict. In a lot of ways, this is the relationship that we're all hoping for, we're all working towards. We just might not even know what it looks like because we haven't come from it. The next combination would be secure and avoidant. And why it works is that on the surface, the avoidant partner appears to have a lot in common with the secure person because they don't have a lot of needs. And so initially it works out kind of well because it's like, hey, I'm just kind of okay. And I'm not asking for a whole lot. And you're not asking for a whole lot. Like, I think we're doing okay here. But over time, that secure person starts to have a desire for some emotional intimacy and depth. And that's really where the problems start is the avoidant person struggles with that. And so what can happen is the secure person can find themselves kind of making these demands about how they need that emotional intimacy and the avoidant person not knowing how to show up, but being too far in to really leave. Um, and then what happens eventually is they do, they leave. And so this is a challenging uh, one because I think it doesn't immediately look the way it is. And we find out later into the relationship, what we ultimately need to do to keep the relationship. So I'm going to tell you the kind of the thing that you need to do to fix it. If you're in it is the avoid needs to learn how to stay and do intimacy and the securely attached person needs to practice some patience about them and allow them space to do it. The next one would be disorganized and secure. And this starts out well also, uh, but the, uh, the disorganized person often comes in, they have really good emotional capacity. They can go there, they can talk about hard things and the secure person like just eats that up because they can too. So it makes a lot of sense. Where it gets challenging though, is that the closer that disorganized person gets, the more they suspect they're gonna be betrayed. 
And even though it's a secure person, they feel unsafe. And they are, again, kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop. And so when it doesn't drop, they, they just get really suspicious and maybe they make the shoe drop. And so in this relationship, what needs to happen is we need to reduce the volatility. We need to stable it out a little bit. And we need to make definite uh, point of having conversations about how we create a stable and secure environment so that we can have important conversations and work towards connection. Next would be secure and anxious. And this is one actually that, that can work out pretty well. Um, it's initially a little overwhelming with the whole double-sided tape thing. Cause we're like, man, why are you sticking to me all the time? Uh, but what we do is if the secure person can have some patience and allow for that anxious person to feel safe, they can begin to have the depth that the anxious person has and the perception and it really works out well. Now, what the anxious person needs to do in this combination is they need to learn to rely on facts as much as feelings. So where the anxious attacher gets into trouble with this combination is that they will feel as though they don't have enough connection. They will feel as though they're not okay or they're not enough. And if they're not careful, they will act on the feeling. And so what I'm always trying to get clients with this combination to do is to rely a little bit more on the facts, not to disregard feelings, but to rely on the facts as well. Because when you rely on those facts as well, they will often tell us what's really true in the relationship and there's stability there. Next is avoidant and avoidant. And I'll just say like, this is a kind of a rare combo because as you might guess, like avoidant people don't really date avoidant people. Um, if they do, it's more kind of hookups or a situationship where there's not a lot of connection. Uh, we don't have a lot of depth and it's temporary. And so sometimes people like engage in this, they actually have seasons in their life where they say like, this is appropriate for them. And so I understand that. Uh, but ultimately if we're working towards a long lasting healthy relationship, um, this is not going to happen unless both work towards security. And really the simplest way for them to do that is to stay and do some work. Next would be disorganized and avoidant. And this one starts out well because the avoidant feels seen by the disorganized because they have really good insight and awareness. Uh, but it can become really volatile then when the disorganized becomes triggered. And so what happens when it becomes volatile is the avoidant has this real tendency to want to run away, right? So they say, oh man, there's like a lot of unicorns here. And I am not sick into this, like I am out. And so what we need to do to kind of work through this is to have the disorganized extensive trust and the avoidant stay. Next is avoidant and anxious. And this is a challenging one in the sense that the one, uh, like the person who is avoidant will often distance and the anxious person will often pursue. And so there is a lot of airtime dedicated to avoidant attachment combinations uh, because it's just really challenging. Because something that makes a relationship magical sometimes is when there's some mystery and suspense, like will they, won't they? And this relationship style factors into that hugely, right? It's like feeds all of that. And so uh, at the beginning, it's very, very exciting because they kind of, you know, the avoidance like doesn't want to be caught. And the anxious person just wants to catch people. And um, so they kind of do this thing. But as a long-term relationship style it is very challenging because eventually someone's tired of it, right? Eventually someone says like, I don't want to be chased or I don't want to chase and then we have trouble. And so as you might imagine, the solution to this is to quit the whole chasing running away thing and to stay put and to get healthy and secure. Next, we have disorganized and anxious and they feel similar. What's different about these is that there's intensity there and that intensity is early on and it's overwhelming. And then what happens is the disorganized has that trigger and the fear of betrayal, the anxious has the need for reassurance and those two just don't mesh well together. And so what happens is the disorganized needs to do some work on that whole betrayal thing, right? And suspicion of it, which again, makes sense from where they came from, but they need to do the work and the anxious person has to find a way to meet some of their needs on their own. We've got just a couple more here, two more. Uh, next is anxious, anxious. And this one I call is the sky falling. And this is kind of fun because like, if you've ever had anxiety, uh, which I've had some anxiety, it's super fun to get with somebody else who has anxiety because all the stuff you're anxious about, they will confirm. And I'm being tongue in cheek about this because it's actually not that awesome. But when two anxious people get together, oftentimes, even though you might think it'd be great, it just exacerbates the problem, right? And so both walk out of it with new ways to be anxious or new things to be anxious about. And so they need to both do the same work, which is to kind of work on self-regulation and managing their emotions. The last one I'm talking about is disorganized and disorganized. So we've got two unicorn glue people together 
And this is like a blockbuster movie with tons and tons of action, which is awesome. There's some twists some turns, but ultimately it kind of fizzles out because a lot of times it has a lot of starting power, but not staying power. And so what both need to do is to kind of work again through that whole betrayal and worrying about betrayal and having that trauma so that we can be present in that relationship and work towards trust and stability. Okay, so that is a lot. I'm gonna take a drink and I'm gonna just give myself a second for you to take a second as well, because here's my question for you. Can you relate to any of these combinations? As I'm walking through these, are you the couple that stole a car and hit each other head on? Are you the blockbuster movie? Are you the sky is falling? Who do you tend to gravitate towards and why? And so take just one minute, I'll just give you like one minute now to write that down. But I want you to start thinking about this. Like as you hear these, what are coming up? Do you have a definite pattern? What does that bring up for you? I'll give you one minute to do that. Okay, perfect. We are going to jump back in. So the next part I want to talk a little bit about is, is there any hope? Because usually by this part of the conversation, people are looking like, oh, geez, okay, like they're realizing stuff. And what's running through their head is, is there hope for me? And this is a really important question, because if there isn't hope, then this is like a really weird workshop, right? For me to tell you, by the way, there's no hope. You're totally screwed. Sorry. That would, that would be crappy. And that's not what I'm going to do. The reason I do my job, I always tell people, is because there is hope. Uh, and there's a lot of it here. And I'll just tell you, even from my perspective, so I connect a lot with the anxious attachment style. Um, since starting this, what's running through my head, if I'm really honest, is I'm like, hey, are they having fun? Is it good? Is it interesting? Are they bored? I can't see them. Is it okay? That's the kind of stuff that's on my heart, right? Now, I hear that, uh, but I know here that it's okay. Like I'm just doing fine, but that's the thing in my heart, okay? But I'll tell you something. Today, I am able to tell you that without it letting me or leading me to a place where I have to ask, where I have to change all my behavior, well, where I have to pretend to be somebody else. I can just show up and say like, yeah, that's the thing that runs through. Like if you've ever seen the stock market, like that's on the ticker screen sometimes, um, but it is not the thing that navigates my life. And so uh, I've done some work. That's how I've got here is I've done some work. But there are still times when it comes out. And I would tell you that that's okay. Because the point here isn't that you just forego how you were born. The point isn't that you are different than your story. And, um, you know, it's no longer your story. The point is like you just kind of take some steps in the right direction. And so a really funny time is I've got this friend, Tony. And we play soccer together. We play old man soccer uh, where everyone just tries not to get injured all the time. And Tony knows me, he's got my number, like he, he's known me for years. And so he's, he's a therapist too, he's got me figured out. And uh, we play soccer and I'm always kind of apologizing and you know go back and forth. And so we go out one night and we're throwing soccer balls in his trunk. And I think Tony knows what's coming because I didn't do great. I didn't play very well. Um, and so I think he kind of anticipates it and he quickly shuts his trunk. And before I can even say, did I do okay? Tony looks at me and he says, you're okay, man. And he slams his door and he drives away. Okay. And so uh, when he does that, he just knows me, right? So he knows that's what's on my heart is I'm wondering, right? Um, and so uh, is that okay? Is it okay to still have these struggles? And I was, absolutely. Absolutely. So I just want to kind of comment on that because um, there's a ton of hope, but we're also not trying to get towards perfection. And so I want to just tell you, like, these things are going to be patterns in your life. And I'm sorry about that, but they are. And the sooner that we practice some awareness and acceptance about that, the sooner we can do something about it. Clinically speaking, I've gotten the privilege of working with so many people who have actually done the work and gotten that relationship. They maybe made a relationship they're in healthy or they found a healthy partner, but they've done the work. And so I just want to kind of tell you a couple of times over, there's so much hope here. That, that's why I do this. I hope that's why you're here is because there is. Also, I want you to note that your attachment style will change over time if you want to work on it. So when we do this work, it can get better. Um, a lot of it has to do with finding a secure partner or finding a partner who wants to work towards a secure attachment style is really important. 
It also means getting into a community of people who are securely attached or know what that looks like, or at least promote some of those things. But where we put ourselves and our willingness to put ourselves there makes all the difference. And so what does it really mean when I talk about like if you do the work? Well, doing the work looks like, I'll just break it down to three things because goodness, I do everything in threes. Number one, you would observe yourself. So you have some awareness about where you struggle, right? So I just told you come up some of my stuff where I'm like, I know like these are things that I'm gonna struggle with. So we have some awareness and some observation. We're honest with ourselves about that because sometimes it's hard to do, right? Sometimes it's hard to say, mm, yeah, that's what's actually true here, but we're honest. Number two is we identify and we communicate our unmet needs. What so much of this is about is being a kiddo that didn't get our needs met for one reason or another. And so we're not going to get better until we know what our needs are. And sometimes people say to me, well, Jason, how do you know what a need is if no one's ever cared? How do I know what my needs are if I've never gotten to ask for them? And I'll just say that, like, I don't think everybody knows what they need right off the bat. Like, I don't think that's just inherent in us. Um, I have a, a friend and we were in high school and he said one time to me, Jason, you know, um, here's what I'm going to do. And like, he just laid out his life. Like he told me who's going to marry. He told me where he's going to go to school. What is he going to do? Like he knew exactly who he wanted to be, what he needed to get there and what he needed internally. But I've never been that way. And here's the thing. Most of my clients aren't. But I'll tell you how we learn instead is we start to try. We start to do stuff and we start to rule out things that really don't matter. And then we start to refine and we get really clear about what we do need. And so you can find this, but you might need to look at it from the perspective of ruling things out instead of just inherently knowing, because I hear people get stalled out so often when they can't just come up with a need. And I just go like, why would you be able to come up with a need? No one's ever asked before. So you might just have to start and then refine from there. Lastly, number three is communication. We have to get good at communication because that's how we work through all of this. As a child, we couldn't communicate. That was just literally not part of the deal. And so part of why we're in this spot is because we couldn't. And so the way that we're going to fix that is to have honest and open communication about what our needs are, like I said, as well as how we're feeling, who we are, what we want, what our dreams are, and to practice vulnerability. Okay, so this is a lot. So what exactly is a healthy relationship then, Jason? And, and let's be honest, I've been beating around the bush of this on Instagram for like a long time, right? So what is a healthy relationship? Well, I'm just going to break it down into a couple of things. But the gist of what we are trying to work for as we do this attachment style work is we want to have mutual attraction and commitment. We want to have a relationship that involves friendship. Like we're actually friends. We'd want to hang out. We have fun sometimes. Sometimes we don't have too much fun. I'm from the Midwest. And so we got to like temper that a little bit. Occasionally we have fun. We have stability. We have safety. Like we know we're mostly going to be okay. We believe the other person has our best interests at heart. Um, we have a little risk taking again, like not much, but we have a little risk taking. We have intimacy. We have communication, which is both verbal and nonverbal. And then we have effective conflict resolution. And these are really important parts of that relationship that we're trying to go to because these qualities are things that maybe we had some of, but not all of. And these are things that securely attached people often have inherently, like they came from that. And so if you don't know what that looks like, ask a securely attached person, because my guess is if you know people like this, they're going to be able to check off some of the boxes. Okay. Okay. What do I say or what do I mean when I say do the work? Okay, so what I mean is probably work with a therapist to better understand those moments and experiences in your life that continue to come up. Because I think that when they continue to come up, it, it's important, like we need to honor that part of ourselves and honor that there's something there we need to deal with. Like it's not for no reason. And so when we talk about like a lack of needs and people asking for needs, if we're being really honest with ourselves, guys, sometimes we have to admit that we haven't really tended to our needs either. That along with not getting those needs met by people who really should have met our needs, we haven't tended to those either. And so when those things are coming up again over and over, that is a signal to us that we need to do some work on it. And that might just be having a conversation with a friend, talking to a mentor or someone that you really respect or talking to a therapist but getting that started and saying like, what is this about and why does it keep coming up and how do I honor that? So as we do that, we wanna practice some self-reflection. And today, hopefully you're kind of identifying like what type of relationship you're drawn to. 
um, and all the different types. And maybe you find a lot of different ones, or maybe there's kind of like one that just happens over and over again. But I want you to see there's a couple of relationship styles just in general, even outside of attachment to be aware of um, where we have like a rescuer victim. So I talked about being careful about that because some of us bring our woundedness into a relationship and that comes out as needing to be saved. And when we do that, we find someone to save us. But what the problem is then is that when we get better, they don't have any work to do. If they are a rescuer and we do our own work, then there's no one to rescue anymore. And the relationship needs to go through a reset and they need to redefine how the relationship works. So that's one kind of style to work out for, watch out for. Another would be relationship siloing where we just coexist together, where uh, kind of like if two avoidance got together, they live in the same house, they might even raise kids together, but they don't have a lot of connection. We want to watch out for the chaos, right? Where it's just this roller coaster that's maybe super fun as a lifetime movie, but it's not great if it's our life. And then we want to watch out for that pursuer distancer. And I talk about these different styles in addition to attachment styles, even though some are irrelevant to it, because these are just relationship styles, period. And so if you're noticing yourself in these, there is a problem with your attachment and how you're connecting to other people. And it's telling you something you should look into. And then what I want to challenge you to do is if you identify this, how do you meet the need in a healthier way? So that's really what we're going to talk a lot about in the kind of recovery process and doing the work is how do I meet the need in a healthy way? Uh, how do I stay instead of running? How do I uh, reassure myself instead of ask for it? Like, how do I meet this very healthy need in a way that's healthy and honoring to me? And one of the ways we do it is we find community. And so when you have community and I would just like to say, like, I think you all have community here. Um, you probably don't know each other, um, but you all showed up at the same place with the same reason to do the same work. And so you start doing this more often. And when you do this more often, you get surrounded by like-minded people who want better things too. And it becomes easier because uh, you're not alone. And so if you've ever felt alone, just know like all the people that are on this, uh, you're not alone. Like they want help too. And so you start to be part of a community that's like this one. Uh, where people are trying to do the work to get better. And then I want to just say too, lastly, what we've talked about today is, is really, this is a, an opportunity and an invitation rather than a demand. Um, I am not coming to you in this um, demanding you to do anything with this. Um, I would love you to if it makes sense, but, but I don't demand that of you. And so maybe what today tells you is things are pretty good. Like maybe you say, hey, I just sat with Jason for a while and like what came out of that? I'm doing okay. And I'm okay with that. Um, or maybe what comes out of that is I want to do some work, uh, but now it's not a good time because like I'm figuring stuff out with my job or I want to do some work and now is a perfect time. Regardless of where you're at, I just want to know like this is an invitation. I think doing the work should always be an invitation and an opportunity and not a demand because when it's a demand, it's not lasting change. It's not for us. And it, and it really hinders those needs that we have that we need to have met. So I will tell you that. Last thing I'll leave you with before I answer some questions is just what kind of legacy do you want to have? So I know where I came from. Um, I love my parents very much, but I don't want to re recreate the marriage they had. I don't want to recreate their uh, attachment style or relationships. And so I want my legacy to be different. And I bet you do too. And so I want you just to take some time and think about like, how do I want it to look when I'm gone? Like, what is my legacy? What do I want them to say about how I did relationships and how I live? And what do I want from that? Okay, we're gonna switch gears a little bit now and I'm gonna answer some questions. So I solicited questions the other day, you might've seen and I got some. And so I'm gonna answer some of those, but then I'm gonna jump over as much time as we have left to answer your questions tonight. So if you have a burning question right now, fire away in the chat and I will try to work through those, but I'm just gonna start with these while you type in your questions, okay? So first one I got was, how do you go from anxious to secure attachment? I think we kind of covered this in a way um, we just surround ourselves with secure people or we identify those traits that we went over today of a securely attached person and we start to walk that out and find people to help us do it. I cannot say enough about mentors along the way. Um, I have several people in my life who I would say are securely attached to. I can call and say, hey, uh, does this make sense or not? And they will tell me. And that has made all the difference for me because I have a sounding board. And so I think one of the best ways to do it is to be in relationship with others because that teaches us how to be in relationship. Let's see. Next, um, what is the difference between silent treatment and distancing uh, when dealing with someone who's avoidant? I think um, 
I don't know. I think they're really both the same. I think the silent treatment is distancing, um, but I think it's distancing without boundaries and without kindness. Um, the silent treatment is a person saying, I need to take some time away or I want to take some time away but they're not communicating it to us. And so I would tell you, if you're a person who has a tendency to go towards silent treatment or distancing, if you have that kind of avoidant attachment style, um, just know like it's okay to take time because uh, we know you get overwhelmed, but what you need to do is you need to tell the other person you're going to, and you need to tell them when you're coming back. And as a bonus, you might even tell them you really care about them uh, before you do that. And then you show up when you said you would and you work it out. What is the best way to work towards secure attachment style? I think we kind of talked about that one already. Um, what do I do in uh, my relationship when I have an attachment style where um, it's broken, but none of us will, neither one of us will leave, right? We both have anxious attachment. And so instead now it's just full of resentment. And this is kind of what I forewarned about when I talked about that combination is that um, instead of doing the, um, you know, where we, we could uh, just negotiate and we could compromise, we do sacrifice. And so what happens is we sacrifice and sacrifice until we have so much resentment that we can't work through it and then we're stuck, but none of us wanna leave because we really need reassurance we're okay. And so I think at that point, you just have to have a hard conversation about what the resentment's about and identify the times that I sacrificed were those required or not and how do we work through that. Anxious attachment, how to enjoy being in the present when dating, not always think worst case scenario, it's like my hobby thinking worst case scenarios. I don't know if I want to quit that, uh, but I guess if you do, that's fine. Uh, but it's kind of fun. I think when we do some grounding stuff and we do some meditation and we get to that place of being present, we stop living in the future and dreaming up these things. What I would also tell you is that oftentimes it's related to creativity. It's just pointed in the wrong direction. And so know that maybe you need something creative to pursue. So you're not always doing this creative thing that's hurtful to you. How do I know if it's truly love or if it's anxious attachment? I love that question. I think that's a little tricky, but I think this is where the facts and the feelings come in because um, I know that's how you feel, uh, but what I wanna know is what are the facts? So factually speaking, how well do we do conflict? How long have we been together? Um, why are we together? Why are they with me? Why am I with them? I want you to make a list of all the facts and we have the facts and I want you to reconcile them with the feelings. And I think from there, we start to get clarity about why we're in. Why do anxious and avoidance seem to attract each other? Again, because it's super fun initially. Um, and I joke about that, but it is sort of fun to get involved in that relationship. It just doesn't have a lot of staying power unless we do the work to make it so. How do we have vulnerable communication? Vulnerable communication is communication where we show up, we listen, and we really don't have an agenda. It is not vulnerable communication when we show up and we are trying to point the conversation a certain way or make something happen. That is not vulnerable. And so being vulnerable is showing up just with a willingness to listen and be present and seeking understanding both for yourself and the other person. Are meaningful relationships attainable with a person with anxious commitment? I sure hope so. Otherwise, this is going to be challenging for me. Yes, it is. Um, will it take some work? Absolutely. Will it take some intention? Sure. But it is definitely possible. And I'd say, I just expand that and just say any attachment style, you can totally have a meaningful relationship. Um, but like any healthy relationship, it takes awareness and insight. What do rescuers, uh, why do they attract people who need rescuing? Well, because they need a job, right? And if they didn't have someone to rescue, they'd have to focus on themselves and that would get really boring. And so it's easier to make it about somebody else and rescue them than it is to kind of face themselves and whatever it is that they need or don't need to do. And I love the questions that are coming. I can't wait to answer those as well. So I got a couple more here and we'll jump over. Um, actually, just one more. How can a secure partner and an anxious partner have a successful relationship? Just lots of communication. Um, but you know, with the Velcro, the double-sided tape, uh, they don't get all tangled into each other. They have good boundaries, they talk about it. Um, because what's true is that like that anxious partner can have really good depth and vulnerability. And so that's actually something a secure person would really want anyway. They just need to have some boundaries about how often they need that reassurance and how much they get from that person so that it's not overwhelming and doesn't push them away. Okay, that's what I had here. I see there are other questions coming in. So I am going to figure out how to expand that. And I wanna start answering some of those. So let's see what we have here.
Okay, how, let's see, how do you help an avoid attachment and disorganize attachment work within a relationship? Um, that's a great question. I think I would say to that, we, we focus on our common ground, right? Because for both of us, intimacy is kind of scary. And so we have that in common. Um, the, the challenge is the one is a lot more inconsistent while the other is a lot more consistent. And so I think where I would start with you if you were coming to talk to me is I just say like, let's talk about the things that we actually have in common and, and feel the same about, which is gonna be a lot of things, how we exercise that's gonna be different. And so we go back to kind of the disorganized person, we're helping them have stability, reduce the chaos, have some staying power. The avoidant person, we're asking them to just be present in the relationship and not run away or check out emotionally or mentally. And then how do you forgive someone you love who is avoidant and has hurt you in the past? This is challenging because they might not even be coming back to you asking for your, uh, your apology or your forgiveness. Um, with avoidant attachment, they might just be gone. And so I think it becomes like forgiving anyone. Um, you can forgive them. You don't have to have a relationship. And this is challenging, especially if you have anxious attachment, because we just want everyone to be okay with us all the time. But I think it comes down to accepting that uh, what happened happened uh, and trying to forgive what you can and trying to have grace where you can, but not uh, deluding yourself about it and just being honest um, and recognizing that that might be something that's unresolved. Let's see, is it possible to fall somewhere between styles? You mentioned avoidant and disorganized are sometimes treated the same, sometimes separate. Um, someone says they can relate to that. Yeah, I, I would relate to what you connect with um, because I think there are you know, different areas where we connect. And, and what, here's what's interesting is that because we can change all of this, if I'm anxious and I'm in a relationship with uh, a person who's avoidant, I'm gonna start to pick up some of their traits. And so over time, depending on who you're in relationship with, you might start to notice it gets a little blurry. And so I would tell you to just have some insight about the things that do apply to you and to start there. And I think from there, you'll get some clarity. How do you work with someone who's anxious and disorganized with a lot of trauma that hasn't worked on it with a therapist? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I come down a lot in, in my practice to willingness. You'll probably hear me talk about it more than you like, but uh, if a person's unwilling to do the work, the change is probably not going to happen. And so uh, what I would just do is to encourage that person to, to get the help they need, to point out that they might have a struggle, and to invite them, same way that I've invited you, and, and let them. And then you get to decide what you do in response, right? So if they're unwilling, you, you might be unwilling too. You might be unwilling to stay. But I think it's important to invite that person and leave it up to them, because if they don't have space, to do it and it's a demand, it's probably not gonna be lasting change even if they do it. Um, how do we do the anxious avoidant where there's connection, um, but we have kind of a shutdown? Um, that's just gonna be a communication thing, right? So it's gonna be the anxious person developing some stability and resilience and willingness to kind of sit in a comfortable spot that feels like rejection. And we're going to challenge that avoidant person to lean into the relationship instead of kind of cutting themselves out uh, because it's important. So I'll talk to my couples about like, what do healthy relationships do? Like, what would a securely attached person do? And do we want that? And they'll say yes. And I'll say, okay, if we want that, what do we need to do that we're not doing? And so that might be where I would start with that type of couple is um, what's it supposed to look like? And do we want that? And if we want that, what do we need to do we're not doing? Can anxious attachment lead to manipulative behaviors? Uh, absolutely, that's a total bummer, but it's true. Um, because we do the people pleasing thing, that is manipulation in a way. Um, I would say it's not always malicious, but that's what it is uh, because we're trying to get people to like us. We're trying to get people to think highly of us. And so um, sometimes things get kind of twisted around and that's not actually healthy for the relationship. Um, okay, someone said they, uh, they identified with one on the quiz but then they kind of find traits of the other that makes sense. And again, I would just go back to like, absolutely, that could be possible depending on the relationship you're in now and how that's working. It, it can kind of cover two. And so just focus on what it is that you connect with. Um, can it change after being in a traumatic or toxic relationship? Absolutely, right? Uh, because again, we kind of grow into the relationship that we're in for better or for worse, right? So we say, well, the antidote to some of this is that uh, if you're, you know, anything other than secure, you find a secure person, you kind of grow into it, right? It's that whole idea of like, 
you show up and you're the people you spend time with. And, and so, yes, that can happen. On the other side, can it happen? Absolutely. Because what happens is that the climate gets really uh, different based on the other person's problems, right? So someone's coming in with a lot of toxicity or trauma, we can end up having some of that rub off on us. And that becomes a new relationship style, even if we didn't go into it with that. Let's see. This last question that I have, I really like. What are some ways that I can identify if I'm asking for too much? So here's what I would tell you. I think first and foremost, that need that you have is always a need, right? So your need is not too much. That's the first thing I would tell you. Like there is not too much need. Um, it's just, am I leaning on this too much for that need? And so that actually is a fantastic conversation to have in your relationship. Uh, and that might just look like I have this need for X, Y, Z. Um, and I am trying to meet you with that, uh, meet you there. And so is that happening too often or how are we doing? Do I need to have some better boundaries? Do I need to have some better coping? Do I need to reach out to different resources? How are we with that? Um, and I think having that honest conversation is helpful. And what I love about it is when you verbalize your need, for me as a therapist, that's like everything. That's such a cool moment to watch someone who has never said what they needed sit down with their partner and say like, hey, this is what I need. Is it working? You know, is it too much? Is it not? And have that conversation. That's an awesome conversation. So I just encourage you to do it. Uh, how do you stop manipulating when you don't know you're doing it? Um, anxiety leads to asking questions, um, explaining how I feel and being told it's manipulation. That one is a little challenging without too much more, um, but I'm going to answer it just the way it is, which is that um, I think when people tell you what you're doing, um, I'm always a little cautious of that um, because I want to know if that's what I'm trying to do. And I think in our healthy relationship, if someone tells us we're doing something and we say no, uh, one of those kind of core attributes is we like give the other person the benefit of the doubt. And so I would just kind of lean into, is that what you're doing? If it is what you're doing, you got to catch yourself and stop. So you might say, I just did that thing where I manipulated. I'm sorry. Let me say that again. If you have any more questions, go ahead. I can answer a couple more. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. All right, so I'm not seeing more questions just yet, which is fine. Um, my hope kind of in all of this is just that tonight you walk away with more information than you started with. You walk away with some clarity about where you are, where you're going, and you use this. And so maybe I'll just end on this question. Someone just submitted this, I really like this question. How do you recognize an attachment style and a potential partner? Well, you make them watch this, obviously, right? That's that's what you do. No, that is not what you do. You, uh, If you purchase one of the books that I reference, they have quizzes for partners where you can actually do the quiz for them and kind of identify this. But I think one of the best things to do is to really know yourself and know the pattern you have and the themes that come up and then recognize where that usually leads you so you can recognize that that's happening, right? So if you are a person who, let's say, is in that pursuer distance or relationship and you see that all the time and then you meet someone and you find yourself doing that, um, that's probably gonna tell you they're avoiding, right? Like that's, that's gonna tell you some stuff. You find someone who it's really disorganized and chaotic, like that tells you. So I think knowing yourself better, knowing the style that you have and the patterns you have will only help you identify those other people. And then remember too, that even if you identify them to have a challenging attachment style based on the one that you have, just know that that isn't the end of the world, but you have to recognize like it's going to require some work. Um, the books I mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to put in the resource guide. So I will, yeah, somebody is actually putting that out. So that's perfect. Um, thank you for that. It'll also be in the resource guide that you will get as a PDF, and then you can come back and watch this. Um, I just want to tell everybody I hope this was really good for you. I hope that you feel like this was valuable time spent. Uh, it definitely was for me. I love to be able to talk to people and help them along the way with their relationships. Um, I will provide the resources and we'll keep going, but just thank you so much for supporting this and giving me a platform to kind of talk with people and expand on this stuff. Um, I appreciate all of you. And then in the next week, we'll send all this stuff out and we'll go from there. So thank you everybody so much for attending. Appreciate it.